Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, the first 11 verses. If you'd like to follow along, you can, it, it's on page 770 in your pew Bibles. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit and to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the dates or times the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. If you'd like to follow along, it is on page 702 and 703 in your pew Bibles. Hear now these words of Jesus. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous... To eternal life. May God bless us and help us understand his word. Amen. Today we continue our series based on the Apostles' Creed, and we're finishing up the middle and major section of the Apostles' Creed, which focuses on Jesus' 
And after last week, we pick up after Jesus' resurrection, that he was risen on the third day, and today we're going to focus on the phrases, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. A lot to unpack here this morning, so let's go ahead and get started. In our text from the book, The Acts of the Apostles, uh, the author, which we know as Luke, who also wrote the gospel according to Luke, begins his sequel by kind of bridging the gap between his gospel and the book of Acts. He writes, as he does in the book of Luke, that he's writing to a uh, Theophilus, who, in all honesty, we have no idea who that is. There has been much speculation over the uh, years of the identity of this Theophilus. Some have suggested that this Theophilus was the one who financed Luke's work. Luke addresses this Theophilus as, quote, the most excellent Theophilus. Uh, and some have suggested that perhaps uh, this was a high government official. Theophilus, the, wor- or the name, literally means friend or lover of God. And some have suggested that maybe this is a code name for a group of Christians or maybe even just all Christians in general. But Luke describes his gospel and how it was focused on Jesus' work and ministry. And now he is going to shift in his sequel to the work of the Holy Spirit through the apostles and the early church. But before he makes this shift, Jesus makes a brief cameo in Acts here in the first chapter. In verse 3, Luke summarizes and mentions that Jesus walked the earth for 40 days after his resurrection, giving proof to people that he really was truly alive in the flesh. And after those 40 days, he gathers his disciples back together and he gives them a few last instructions. In verses 4 and 5, Jesus tells his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. And at this, the disciples are all eager, and they ask if if this is the time that he is going to restore the kingdom of Israel. I imagine that it, it must have saddened Jesus to hear his disciples still focused on the earthly kingdom of Israel especially when he had spent so much time teaching about the kingdom of God. But despite his possible sadness, he essentially tells his disciples to not worry about that at this time. But instead, he gears them up to be prepared, to be prepared to spread the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Once Jesus gave the Great Commission, or his mission to his disciples to make more disciples, Jesus is all of a sudden taken up into the clouds. In Jewish and Christian thinking, the, the realm of God, or what we usually call, as, uh, call heaven, is usually considered to be above us. The cloud, which is present here, that Jesus disappears into, is similar to uh, the time when Moses and the nation of Israel met with God at Mount Sinai. The cloud around the mountain represented God's presence. So therefore, if we put those together, when Jesus ascends back into the cloud, he is going up and into into the presence of God. In the early church, which we often see in Paul's writings, Jesus' ascension back to the Father was often associated with, with Christ's exaltation. And it is said that he, when he ascended, sat at the right hand of the Father. Now this is quite a phrase to unpack. Often in uh, the Protestant church, we really don't emphasize Jesus' ascension all that much. But Jesus' ascension is a pretty crucial event in our faith. In his incarnation and in his birth, the divine son takes on flesh and becomes one of us in his life and his death and his resurrection. 
There have been many thoughts over the years that when Jesus ascended back to God, he stripped off his flesh and became the the, the divine son again. But his ascension shows how Jesus continues to be human even in heaven. And this is very crucial for all of us, and I'll, I'll try to explain that in a few minutes. Jesus' ascension also shows us the permanence of his resurrection. Jesus did not rise from the dead only for those 40 days, but forever. He rises and to be with God forever. And I think this is also a glimpse into our own resurrection someday, that our resurrection will not just be for a small time, but for forever. There's also some confusion over what exactly it means when Christ, quote, is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The Old Testament foretold of the Messiah's sitting at God's right hand. In Psalm 110, verse 1, David wrote, quote, The Lord, that is God, said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. To try to summarize this shortly, Jesus pointed out in Luke 20 that the second Lord mentioned, that that David mentions, is Jesus himself. Through this text, it was foretold that Jesus would return back to the Father, that he would sit at the right hand of the Father. The right hand of God is a symbolic place of power and honor and distinction and prestige. We often maybe say today, my right hand man or woman, that's someone kind of the, 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 that's, that's your go-to person. That is a place of honor and prestige to the person. Jesus who emptied himself of his glory when he became one of us is now restored by the Father to his power and glory. The imagery of sitting is an interesting one too because sitting is usually uh, given in the terms of completion, of, of sufficiency, of being done. And Jesus sitting means that his earthly work is complete. Often, I imagine, unless you stand all the time, when you have finished a project, you sit. It's done. You are finished. Now, while Jesus' earthly work may be complete and finished, his entire work is not yet done. Part of Jesus' work at the right hand of the Father is, is, as he said, is to prepare a place for his people and also to be the go-between between between humanity and God. I think this is why it's very important to note that Jesus remains human even at the right hand of the Father because he represents us before the Father. That is why we do not need to fear when we stand before God one day because Jesus is the one who tells the Father, yes, I know this one. This is one of my sheep. That is also why the book of Hebrews calls Jesus our high priest. A priest is a mediator between God and human. And if Jesus is both God and human, that means he can represent both and speak on behalf of both. Also, as a side note, this is why as a Protestant minister, I am not a priest. Yes, I believe I am God's messenger, but I am not your mediator between God and you. That's what Jesus does. And I do not want to take the place of Jesus. Now, while Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, he also promised that he would one day come again. And that's where we get into our text from Matthew 25. Jesus at this time is in a a long session, a long teaching lesson about his return. And beginning in chapter 24, Jesus is preparing his disciples to be on alert, to be on watch 
for his second return. The text we read today gives us a glimpse into what happens at Jesus' return, specifically the thought that he returns to, quote, judge the living and the dead. Jesus begins the text in Matthew 25, again talking about his return. And he says it in such a way that if you're afraid you're going to miss Jesus' return, you do not have to worry or lose sleep. You will know. Because he claims that he will come in a big fanfare, seated on his throne with all the heavenly realm accompanying him. And then everyone, those who have passed and are asleep, who are dead, and those who are still living, will be gathered before the throne of Jesus. And then Jesus groups those gathered before him. Some are sheep and some are goats. The imagery of sheep has been a consistent one throughout Scripture for the people of God. Often we know it in Psalm 23. Goats, on the other hand, is a, is a different one, I admit, and, and, and goats are not often used and are not necessarily portrayed in a bad way, but it seems that Jesus is using that distinction in this text. And then he places the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. As I mentioned before, the right side was a place of honor and distinction, the place for the people of God. Someone's left side wasn't usually a place of dishonor, but again, in this text of what Jesus is trying to teach, it is given that distinction here. And then Jesus, the king, says to the sheep, his people, those on his right, that they are welcomed into the kingdom, and they are welcome to share in their, in their inheritance and the blessings of God. There's a surprised reaction from the sheep. They, 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 they're surprised. We? Jesus says, yes, you are the ones who have done all these things. You have fed the hungry, gave drink to the thirsty, clothed the naked, visited the sick and the poor. And they ask, Lord, when did we do these things? I think the surprise indicates, just like Susie was talking about before with the children, they were not doing these acts of kindness and mercy and love just to gain entrance into the kingdom. They did these things because they were already members of the kingdom. They did this because they follow the servant Lord and they are moved and transformed by the Holy Spirit. They do these because of their love. The goats, on the other hand, are told to depart from Jesus' presence and they are condemned to the eternal fire. The goats respond in a similar way to Jesus. When did we not do these things? And Jesus responds in a similar way he did to the sheep. But except the goats have not acted in love and mercy to the least of these. And Jesus concludes this dramatic judgment by stating, then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. There has been much and many debates over the when and the how of Jesus' return. We could be here for days <clears throat> describing and talking about all the ways Jesus' return has been talked about, and I don't think anybody wants to do that right now. But what I hope is that all Christians can agree that at least we know that one way or another, the life that we have, the life that we see, <clears throat> will come to an end at one time. That all history will come to a climactic finale when Jesus returns. And the point I want to get across to us this morning is that what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples, his followers, is that his return may be sooner than we think. And so we need to be prepared. As Jesus taught, we do not know the day or the hour, but the bottom line is that Jesus will return. 
And to prepare for that, I, I think the life motto that theologio, theologian Michael Wilkins came up with is a good idea to follow. He says we should live, quote, live as though Jesus is coming back today and then plan as though he is com- not coming back for a hundred years. We need to be prepared for Jesus now. We need to live in faith and service today. Yet, as we have seen, Jesus' return is delayed, and he has not returned yet. And Christians throughout the centuries have expected Jesus to return at any moment. The first century Christians thought Jesus was going to return in their lifetime And many throughout the last 2,000 years have have thought the same and have tried to calculate exactly when when he might come back. Unfortunately for us, 100% of them have been wrong. Some Christians have even anticipated Christ's return by selling all that they have except the shirt off their back, have excluded themselves from community and, and hope that Jesus would return tonight but they often find themselves in a quandary with exactly that, a shirt on, nothing but a shirt on their back and no Jesus in sight. We have this delicate line to walk of being ready both for tomorrow and for the distant future. We don't know when Jesus will return, but, but we need to be prepared. But to be clear, I'm not trying to scare us. I'm not trying to suggest that we... I'll go up in a panic and a frenzy and, and, what, and what not, right here, right now. No, I'm not saying that. But we also should not have the mentality of, there's always tomorrow. Because we don't know that. Life is fragile and fleeting. We have all known people, loved ones, friends, family, who have been with us today and are gone tomorrow. Any of us could go meet our maker tomorrow. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. We must be ready at any given time to meet our master and Lord. Whether it be at the end of our life, which tomorrow, 20 years, 80 years, or at the end of history. May we live as though Jesus is coming back today. But may we also plan as though he's not coming back for a hundred years. May we live and serve Jesus today, all while anticipating his return in glory and in might. Amen.